So now I want to transition into talking more about hardness of SAT, like KSAT, but not for random instances, just in the worst case. So I want to explore a little bit or tell you a little bit about what is known about solving KSAT on not random instances, but potentially any instance. So, okay, let's say you have a KSAT or CNF SAT, like you're given a CNF formula, and there's actually two parameters there, n the number of variables and m the number of clauses, but basically n is the most important parameter, and you should mentally assume that m the number of clauses is polynomial in n the number of variables. Well, there's definitely the brute force algorithm that runs in time basically two to the n, two to the n times poly m, you just Enumerate all possible two to the n truth assignments, and for each one, check if it satisfies the given CNF formula. So can you do better? Uh, well, let's first talk about 3SAT. I put a lot of information up on this slide, but let's go through it slowly. So let's first talk about 3SAT. As I mentioned before, you can do better than two to the n time for 3SAT. In fact, uh, you, can do, you can solve 3SAT instances in 1.31 to the power of n time. Uh, which is interesting. And uh, this algorithm is kind of complicated, but there is uh, an algorithm that gets 1.333 to the power of n time, which is only very marginally worse. And the algorithm is so simple, I can like fully state it to you here. And not only do I state the algorithm here, the proof is actually not too hard. I mean, you can do it in half an hour or so, depending on your level of sophistication. Uh, it's called the WOXAT algorithm due to Schoening from 1999. And here's how it goes. You're giving your three CNF formula, pick a random assignment, and check to see if it's satisfiable. Maybe it is. Well, the chance of that could be like two to the minus n, but okay. If it's not satisfiable, then what you do is just take any clause that's unsatisfied. So a clause is an or of three literals. And you know this current assignment must be making all three of the literals false, because you know a clause, an or is satisfied if at least one literal is made true. So uh, just take any of the variables appearing in that clause and flip its value, this truth assignment. And that'll actually make that clause now satisfied. And it might make some other clauses satisfied, and it might make some other clauses unsatisfied, but that's it. Just take any clause that's unsatisfied, flip a random variable in it, and um, do this step a bunch of times. Do this step like order n times, and like as you flip variables, you know, find an unset clause, pick a variable in it, flip it. Find an unset clause, pick a variable in it, flip it. Do that like order n times, and maybe you'll find a satisfying assignment. If so, great. If not, then you kind of say to yourself, you know, I picked like a bad starting random assignment. Let me just go all the way back to step one, find like a totally new, start with a totally new random assignment, and then do this like local search kind of thing for like order and steps. And you do that routine like four thirds to the end time. And um, yeah, the analysis shows that this algorithm you know, if the instance is unsatisfiable, it'll never find a satisfying assignment, so it'll eventually give up. And uh, the analysis shows that if this, uh, if you give it any satisfiable 3CNF, then with high probability, you'll find a satisfying assignment with this algorithm after like O tilde of four thirds of the n steps. And in fact, there's a nice generalization of this algorithm to the case of KSAT, whoops, KSAT, where the running time becomes like two minus two over K to the power of n. So it's 1.5 to the n for 4 sat, and uh, it's 1.6 to the n for 5 sat, and so forth. And so as k gets large, it gets close to 2 to the n time, which is trivial. But for every fixed k, it's better than 2 to the n time. OK, so uh, 3 sat, we know, is solvable in better than 2 to the n time. It's even solvable in 1.3 to the n time. Uh, but you know, can you solve it a lot better? Can you solve it in two to the root n time maybe? Well, we don't know any algorithm like that. We don't know any algorithm that solves it in two to the n to the 0.99 time. And okay, after a lot of work, people couldn't do it. And so in Pagliazzo and Paturi in 1999 made uh, an assumption called the ETH, exponential time hypothesis. That simply says, you know, three sat takes at least two to the 0 0.0001 times n time. Or more accurately, you know, there exists some universal constant delta such that 3 sat needs time 2 to the delta n for all sufficiently large uh, n. Okay, so this is like a direct strengthening of p does not equal np, right? p does not equal np is equivalent to saying that 3 sat cannot be solved by any polynomial time algorithm. This algorithm's 
the ETH is saying 3SAC cannot even be solved by any two to the little of n time algorithm. Okay, so there's ETH. And uh, again, what's cool about it is, you know, you're making a stronger assumption than the P does not equal NP. But if you make it, you can derive some stronger conclusions that we don't know how to conclude merely assuming P does not equal NP. For example, let me give you an interesting example. Back in the 70s, like they were really into what are the consequences of P does not equal NP? And there's a whole theory of um, NP completeness developed and like many, many, many theorem problems were proved to be NP complete. And one such NP complete problem shown to be NP complete in 1976 was the planar Hamiltonian path problem. The version of Hamiltonian path where like the graph is planar. So it's like Hamiltonian path, but it's easier because like it's definitely gonna be on a planar graph, but they showed it's still NP hard. Okay, and how do you do that? Well, they came up with some smart reduction from 3SAT. It's a polynomial time reduction, and it outputs a planar graph. And you know, if the 3SAT instance is satisfiable, the planar graph has a Hamiltonian path. If the 3SAT instance is unsatisfiable, the planar graph doesn't have a Hamiltonian path. Now, I'm gonna ask you to fill in a blank here in a moment. Um, their reduction has the following property. On inputs of size n, the reduction for producing the graph runs in cubic time, and it produces a graph whose size, like number of vertices and edges, is n squared. So um, under the assumption of ETH, you can conclude that planar Hamiltonian path requires at least a certain amount of time on size capital N inputs. And I'm asking you, what is that certain amount of time? You know that three of the sat requires this much time. And you know this reduction. How much time does planar Hamiltonian path require? Yes, I got the correct answer in the chat. Thank you very much. It's two to the omega square root capital N time. And just to talk you through it, you know, imagine conversely that you could solve planar Hamiltonian path in better than two to the a square root capital N time. Imagine you could solve it, this is my terrible drawing, in two to the little o of root n. Then you would contradict ETH. You would solve three sat in better than exponential time. How? Given a three sat instance, stage one, you would run this reduction. The fact that this is n cubed time is no problem at all. It's hardly relevant because you're shooting to solve the three sat instance in like two to the little o of n time. So n cubed time is nothing special. But you do get a planar graph of size little n squared. And so then your hypothetical uh, planar Hamiltonian path algorithm runs in time that's better than two to the root capital N. So it's running in time two to the little o of n. And that contradicts ETH. So you see what was actually quite important here is the how efficient your reduction was. And this is why like this sport of proving hardness results is actually really about algorithms. You're trying to find really efficient reduction algorithms. And what really mattered here, not so much the running time of the algorithm, but how much the size blow up was. And what's also interesting is uh, it's a fact that you can solve planar Hamiltonian path in time two to the order root n. So this result is kind of tight. Um, in general, uh, ETH is good for showing that, you know, your favorite problem your favorite NP complete problem requires a large exponential amount of time. So um, we saw a planar Hamiltonian path that showed that it required two to the root and time. And for most like classic NP complete problems that you learn about in like a first course on NP completeness, you show like, you know, three coloring is NP hard and Hamiltonian path and independent set. All these classic reductions tend to have um, only linear size blow up. That's why I chose this like weird one for my example, planar Hamiltonian path. And that means that for all these, I mean, you have to take my word for it, you have to inspect these reductions, but it's true. And it means that if you assume ETH, you conclude that all of these kind of classics like three coloring and independent set also require sort of full exponential time, two to the omega of n. Uh, there's a question that says, so under ETH, there cannot be a linear size blow up reduction to planar Hamiltonian path. Absolutely correct. So like if you assume ETH, um, then there does not exist a algorithm for Hamiltonian, a reduction from three sat to Hamiltonian path that takes instances of size n to instances of size n to the 1.9. And that's kind of cool actually, because we'll get to this in a, in a moment. If you think about that, 
that itself is a non-existence result for algorithms. Okay, it's sort of like a weird problem, the problem of reducing three-sat to ha planar Hamiltonian path, but it shows that it cannot be done in a very efficient way, like with size blow up uh, n to the 1.9. In particular, it cannot be done in time n to the 1.9, because if you only have n to the 1.9 time, you only have time to write out a planar graph of size n to the 1.9. So as we'll see in a moment, these kinds of assumptions can also be used to show hardness results in P. Um, yeah, let me also mention that like, uh, it's maybe I should have mentioned earlier, but like it's a common misconception among some people that all NP hard problems should require two to the omega n time. That's not true. Um, for example, planar Hamiltonian path can be done in two to the root n time. And it's NP hard to decide if a graph has a independent set of size n to the 0.01. That's true, but you can solve that problem in time like basically exponential in n to the 0.01 by trying all subsets of size n to the 0.01. Um, so ETH basically shows that um, if you assume it, no polynomial time, there's, sorry, no NP hard problem can have a running time that's better than two to the N to the epsilon. So you can't have like an N to the log N time algorithm for an NP complete problem, assuming ETH. But there's nothing wrong with a two to the N to the 0.01 time algorithm. Uh, there's a question, uh, I think regarding this uh, discussion of um, potential algorithms for reducing three sat to planar Hamiltonian path. The question is, but could there be an exponential time reduction? Yes, maybe. So you do have to be, I said this, this aspect of the reduction usually doesn't play a big role, but you know, if this reduction took two to the n time, then you, know, you wouldn't be able to make any of these conclusions uh, because then the reduction time would swamp you know, your, your algorithm time for three set. And in fact, there is a two to the n time reduction. The reduction can just like solve three set itself in two to the n time. And then basing, based on whether the instance was satisfiable or unsatisfiable, it'll output some trivial constant size planar graph, which either does or does not have a Hamiltonian path. So let me just uh, say a few known facts about ETH. And uh, you know, you, what, I'm, what I'm trying to get here is you should you know, put ETH in your pocket too. And if you're ever trying to show some problem it's uh, hard to solve in a certain amount of time, maybe consider starting from ETH. So there is an algorithm for vertex cover. If you want to decide if a graph has a vertex cover of size K, most naive algorithm would run in time like N to the K. But a smart algorithm exists that runs in time like 1.3 to the K times poly N. But it's known using ETH that you cannot get a sub-exponential in K times poly N algorithm. So for the K clique problem, there's definitely an N to the order K time algorithm. You check all vertex uh, sets of size K and see if they're clique. Unlike with vertex cover, you can't seemingly do better than that. And ETH uh, shows that there's no algorithm that's like even two to the two to the K times N to the square root K. That's impossible under ETH. That's a theorem. I mean, it's not like obvious or anything. Or for one more example, when we studied tree width, we saw that there are a lot of results like this. Like if you want to solve max cut, it, it's, you know, there'd be hard problems, so you can't do it. But on bounded tree width graphs, you can do it in polynomial time. And these things, uh, these algorithms run in something like two to the tree width times poly n. And under ETH, you can show that you cannot get like a uh, sub-exponential in tree width times poly n. So it really kind of lays out like what is possible or not uh, by efficient algorithms. Okay, so let me show you a variation on this story. So I mentioned that for KSAT, which is a harder problem, there was this WalkSAT algorithm that runs in time like two minus two over K to the N time. So some number that's slightly less than two and it gets more and more slightly as K gets bigger uh, to the power of N. And the fastest known algorithm is a bit better than this. It's kind of crazy. It runs in time two to a certain constant uh, times n, where that constant is very close to one, but it's one minus pi squared over six k. So as k gets bigger and bigger, this also goes to the two to the n time. But for every fixed k, it's like a little bit better than two to the n time. And there's another assumption called strong ETH, or Seth, 
made later by Polyazzo Paturi and Zain, which says that, you know, this is the best thing. So it says that for any number delta, there is some large enough k such that k sat requires time 2 to the 1 minus delta n. So, you know, it's basically saying as k gets bigger and bigger, you really need an amount of time which is converging to 2 to the n, the brute force algorithm. Um, let me also comment, it's not obvious actually that strong ETH is stronger than ETH, but it is a theorem that e strong ETH implies ETH. So it is well-named, it is stronger. And, um, you know, I don't know if I say it here, uh, yeah, a slightly variant statement is basically morally the same as strong ETH. It's just to say that like, the CNF set problem, CNF set problem where you're not given any, it's not case sad, there's no a priori upper bound in the clause widths, it's just you're given a CNF, is it satisfiable or not? Seth is basically equivalent to saying that that problem requires time two to the n times poly in the number of clauses. But this is the formal definition. And uh, its main use is this topic that we touched on a little bit earlier, which is called fine grain complexity, which is like a, kind of a new field of algorithms and complexity that's been developed over the last five or 10 years, um, particularly by a couple of people that are CMU graduates, uh, Virginia Vasilevsko Williams and Ryan Williams, among other people. Um, it's also all sometimes called hardness with, within P. So this is about showing that it's for problems that can be solved in polynomial time. You really wanna drill down into like, well, what's the fastest polynomial for solving them? And uh, that's a very important question because of course in real life, there's a tremendous difference between like a quadratic time algorithm for a problem in a linear or quasi-linear time algorithm for a problem. Quasi-linear time algorithms are usually very practical. Quadratic time algorithms are usually basically unusable. Um, so it's very important, but you know, an assumption like P does not equal MP has no power to tell you anything about that because you know, in P versus NP, you totally gloss over all polynomial time factors. So you can't hope to drill down into these things. But this is a very fine assumption and you can actually use it to prove cool things along these lines. So let me tell you an example uh, fact about a reduction. This is uh, due to backers and Indic from 2015. I'll just tell you a, a fact about it and then ask you to fill in the blank at the end. So they came up with uh, a reduction algorithm for K, from KSAT to a very famous problem called edit distance. This is a very famous string problem. Um, it's given two strings, you know, what's the shortest, uh, what's the edit distance between them? What's the least number of like insertions, deletions, and replacements you need to do to the string X to get string Y? It's a very important problem in I don't know, comp bio and other things. And it can be solved in polynomial time. It's not NPR. It can be solved in polynomial time using dynamic programming. But uh, here's what they showed. They showed there is a reduction uh, from KSAT that takes an instance with N variables and it outputs two strings whose length is like two to the n over two, which is a bit crazy if you've never thought about these kinds of reductions before. Strictly speaking, it's two to the n over two times poly n, but basically two to the n over two. So it outputs these enormously long strings. Incidentally, its running time is also something like two to the n over two times poly n. So it's like basically linear time in, uh, quasi-linear time in its output size. So it takes you know, a, three, a case out instance, outputs two enormous strings. And the theorem is that if phi is satisfiable, then the edit distance between these two strings will be some number k, um, you know, that the uh, reduction can also output. But if phi is unsatisfiable, then the edit distance between these two strings will be at most k minus one. And uh, so this shows that in some sense, if you can solve edit distance, you can solve k sat. And the set assumption is about you know, how long it takes you to solve KSAT. So you can actually deduce something about how long it takes you to solve edit distance. So yeah, now I'm asking, you wanna type into the chat if you like, from this, what can you conclude about how long it takes to solve the edit distance problem on length capital N strings? And uh, we got the correct answer, N squared, yeah. Well, basically N squared. So N to the any number less than two. So why is that? Uh, well, again, suppose on length n strings, you had some cool algorithm that solved the edit distance problem. It computed the edit distance between the two strings in capital N to the 1.9 time. 
Well, as I'll say in a moment, you'd become instantly famous in the field of algorithms because getting such an algorithm has been open for, well, at least 40 years. But anyway, suppose you had such an algorithm. Then you could solve KSAT in time, like slightly better than two to the n, two to the little n. How? Well, you take your KSAT instance, you run this algorithm. That only takes two to the 0.5 n time, so that's no problem for your overall time budget. You get these two strings of length capital N equals two, two to the little n over two. Now you run your hypothetical capital N to the 1.9 time algorithm for edit distance. And so that lets you tell which case you're in over here for edit distance. And therefore, it lets you tell if five is satisfiable or not. And so you solved case at, and your running time is like this quantity to the power of 1.9, which is, you know, a little bit less than two to the n. It's two to the, you know, uh, 0.95 n. So it contradicts set. So this is cool. It tells you like, uh, I mean, if you assume Seth, which is a very strong assumption, but if you assume Seth, then you get that, you know, edit distance cannot be solved in some quadratic time. And uh, trying to solve edit distance in some quadratic time is a problem that's been intensively studied for like over 40 years. The fastest algorithm is like n squared over log squared n. Uh, so it's kind of like an awesome develop in algorithms theory over the last uh, five years. I mean, it raises the question, well, how much do we believe Seth? It's a very strong assumption. And um, I know some experts who are like, I believe ETH, but I don't believe strong ETH. But I believe strong ETH. Why not? I don't know. We don't know any algorithms that contradict it. it seems pretty hard. Uh, another way to think of it is like, if you could just get an n to the 1.9 time algorithm for edit distance, you can translate that into an amazing algorithm for a case ad. I mean, you would break Seth. OK, so a few more facts like this about Seth. There are many, many consequences of Seth that are like this. I'll just say real quickly, it's an ancient algorithm for finding the diameter of a graph in order m times n time. Basically, you run Dijkstra uh, n times. And Seth implies that you cannot get m times n to the 1 minus epsilon. So if like m is proportional to n, you have like a sparse graph, you can find the diameter in quadratic time. This shows you cannot get it in some quadratic time. Similarly, if you want to solve all pairs max flow in a graph, you can do it in m times n squared time. Seth implies that you cannot do it in m times n to the 2 minus epsilon time. Um, you know, although there's like a, a, a what's it called? Pseudo polynomial time algorithm for subset sum. So if you have n integers, and your target t is not too large, then you can actually solve subset sum efficiently. So subset sum is only hard when you're talking about like a target number, which itself is like n digits long. But if the target number is like, uh, like poly n, so it's uh, only log n digits long, then actually by using a dynamic programming algorithm, you can solve subset sum in like n log n time. Um, but Seth sort of shows this is optimal. So assuming Seth is like another theorem of a boot at all, um, no, you cannot do it in t to the 1 minus epsilon times anything sub-exponential in n. Okay, so it's another example of getting very precise uh, results about algorithmic running time under, you know, one assumption set. 